that you the list of my work from the last year. Last year, I mainly coded X JavaScript target, uh, doing drawings, basically. I'm a painter now, but yes. So I want to introduce you vector graphics. Probably all of you know, know what a vector graphic is. Just, just to be clear, vector graphics is the use of geometrical primitives to represent images in computer graphics. So you draw using lines, circles, shapes, paths, everything that is not a pixel painted on a bitmap. You have mainly two options to paint on the browser, which are SVG and uh, Canvas. SVG is a pure vector graphic um, platform, so you really draw using vectors, while Canvas is a bitmap, so you draw on it using pixels. You have, of course, other options. <coughs> Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Better? Yeah. Nice. So you can use other technologies like WebGL, for example, but WebGL is not yet supported on all the browsers. So particularly the mobile section is still lagging behind. You have Flash, of course, which is a proprietary thing. Silverlight, same thing, and Unity. There are probably other means to draw in your browsers, but those are the most common cases. So we will focus on SVG, and we will compare it to Canvas. SVG is nice because it's resolution independent, is very easy to animate. You have actually uh, three means to animate SVG. SVG has embedded a language which is called SMIL uh, to create animations. You can use CSS transitions, or you can use a scripting language like JavaScript to animate SVG. So you have many options. And the other very nice thing of SVG is that it's XML, and as much as you can edit that, that format is really easy to debug and watch and analyze. And also, when you embed SVG into a browser, you can inspect using tools like Firebase, because the elements of the SVG are inspectable as any other HTML element. So you can see styles applied, you can see uh, the attributes, all alive. On the other side, we have Canvas, which has very high performances. It's best for uh, raster graphics, so if you need to paint at the pixel level, Canvas is better. But there are some cons. So SVG becomes slower when you're seeing uh, increasing complexity. There are cross-browser issues. Mainly, you can name it as Internet Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there is no pixel drawing unless you want to build very complex scenes. On Canvas, on the other side, you don't have a DOM. So the, the Canvas is actually a bitmap. You can only analyze pixels. There is a, not an animation API, and there are not events. Even if the last a few days ago I have seen a draft for adding events inside the Canvas. So maybe in the future we will have those. What are the SVG issues that you can encounter? The first one is SVG filters. SVG filters are extremely powerful. You can do a lot of stuff with SVG filters, but no Internet Explorer, no iOS for Safari, and no Android 4. And also SVG filters are really CPU intensive, so if you add a filter, Firebug will hate you, and probably crash at some point. <laughs> You cannot use SVG fonts, and SVG fonts are not uh, are using SVG elements as glyph inside your text, and they are not supported in Internet Explorer, and strangely in Firefox. The smear animations are not available in Internet Explorer, so they are cut out, and no GPS transition for Internet Explorer. But still, I think that CSS transitions make still sense because if your animation is just for aesthetic purposes, uh, then you can remove that feature from, uh, from your visualization. It will only affect Internet Explorer, but it will still render correctly. It will just not animate. And CSS transitions are really, really nice. So we will see a, a small example later. The other, this is, in my opinion, the worst thing that could happen to SVG. Internet Explorer doesn't support foreign objects and will not support it, apparently, not even in Internet Explorer 10. 
So what is for an object is a, an SVG element that allows you to embed other XML inside SVG. So you could add HTML inside SVG using a text rendering system that is very advanced, like the HTML renderer. And if you have worked with the text and hispan elements in SVG, you know the pain when you want to format the text in SVG. It's really, really complex. Uh, or you can potentially embed a canvas <coughs> element inside an SVG, which is also a nice thing to do tricky stuff. Or you could add uh, a form inside SVG. No, you cannot. You can, unless you can if you're using a very close uh, system. So, what is the aspect on it of an SVG file? This is an SVG embedded inside an HTML document. This is the HTML5. If there is not complexity in here, you can see that there is a body with an SVG uh, tag. Uh, if you are going to use this code inside WebKit implementation that are headless, like PhantomJS, for, uh, for example, you will need to be more st uh, uh, stricter. So you will need to actually use XHTML, not HTML5. You will have to pass proper headers, and you will have to use a proper extension for your files. Otherwise, PhantomJS will not render your SVG. And this is pretty common in a series of, of browsers that are used on the server side, which is Server, uh, server side uh, web kits are really useful because you can render images on your server as a service and deploy images, static images or PDF, or st uh, stuff like that. Okay, so this is what is rendered at this small screen. Uh, so we have an SVG container which has defined a width and a height and some namespace and a version. There is a group inside of it. The group has no visual representation that can be used to group <coughs> elements and can be used to transform the elements inside. In this case, a translation and rotation are applied. Then we have a rectangle element with its coordinate and, uh, and size, a circle, a line, and a path. Uh, the ni nice thing here is that colors and styles and strokes and fields are all styled using uh, CSS. And if you are familiar with CSS, you will have no issues to decode what is at line six and seven. So instead of talking about borders, you talk about strokes, and instead of using background, you use fields. But the rest is pretty uh, much the same. Probably the main difference is that you don't specify units. You can specify units, but you, don't, you usually don't. And uh, units are expressed in pixels unless you specify a different coordinate system. So. Uh, to help me out in working with SVG, I've built two libraries. One is called the DHX and the other THX, which I call Thanks, because it helps me a lot, so I thank my library every day. Uh, they are basically a part of a very nice library which is called the D3, D3JS. Uh, so what was specific to the JavaScript implementation and the D2 DHX, and what was generic and could be used uh, on all the targets and the D2 things, which is a general purpose uh, cross-platform library. In things, there are more things that actually that are in D3, so there are things that we will see briefly. Uh, for example, you have classes to manipulate colors, you can create FGB, HSV, and CMYK, and grayscale colors, and transform from one to, the end to another. You can create interpolators, like in this case, I'm interpolating over the rainbow at several steps. You have uh, other utility classes, like date parsing, which take uh, English uh, phrases and transform those to meaningful dates, like one week ago at noon. I did that yesterday, so it was. One day, one week and one day ago. Not accurate right now, but still working. You have math uh, functionalities like equations and scales that you can use inside DHX or not. You have date data formats like CSV, JSON, uh, IMI. So you can encode and decode the, those formats and transform from one to the other. You have string format functionalities, localization, geographic projections, that are used 
control geographic files, GeoJSON. You, there is a graph implementation with a very nice, in my opinion, Sugiyama method implementation. The Sugiyama method allows you to uh, minimize the ed, uh, crossing of edges in a graph. And it's a pretty complex uh, system. There are geometry layouts that allows you to define things like uh, slices in a pie chart or uh, some specific pathways like di diagonals. And then there are SVG helpers that allows you to transform those task definitions into uh, SVG pathways. Then we have the DHX library, which is essentially a DOM handling library. So you can set easily attributes, styles, oops, classes, HTML and text content, properties, and so on. So this is basically what jQuery does with a different kind of style. What is very powerful in DHX and D3, where this inspiration comes, is the data building. Okay. So before uh, taking a look at the data building, I want to show you a little snippet of code using DHX. In this case, I'm selecting a, an existing div element inside my page. I'm appending an SVG element to it and defining its style. Then I iterate 100 times, adding circles. And the circles have a, a random center, so random x, y coordinate, random radius, and uh, a set of styles, opacity, fill, and stroke. And this is the result, nothing, nothing special there. I, maybe it was too fast? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, what is data building? Data building is essentially pairing your data sets to the DOM elements of your, of your visualizations. So in this case, I have a very simple array of integers, and I want to pair those data to my DOM. Uh, how do I do that? I actually start from my SVG container, or any kind of element. This applies to HTML or whatever elements you have. I do a select all circle, meaning this is a CSS selector. I want all the elements that are of the type circle. And I associate the data in the array to those circles. So what happens? If those circles do not exist yet, I have an enter option. And in the enter option, I create those elements. So I create for each of those four items, I create one circle. And the circle will have <coughs> several properties, which the first one is the x coordinate. And I'm saying, use the position in the data set to define the position on the x-axis. So I'm saying multiply the position by 200 and add an offset of 100 pixels. So they will be distributed horizontally. Then I have a CY and the R um, property, and those are associated to this H scale function. The H scale function is a, a real scale for a behave, and they are defined using, using this linear uh, scale function. So, a linear scale takes a domain and a range. The domain is the values I have inside my, my data set, and the range are, is the um, pixel mapping I want to produce. So I want to produce, I want to map those values, those integers values, to a range of 0 to 100 pixels. And I use those as the coordinates of my <coughs> two attributes. And then I have a simple field. And this is the effect. So I'm distributing on the x-axis. And I'm saying that the radius and the position of the circle is proportional to this scale and the data. So now I've created a binding between 1 and this circle, 2 and this circle, 4 and this circle, and 8 and this circle. What is nice is that uh, I can, I will get back to that later, I can also define other actions beside enter. So if I have a data set, and this data set changes over time, I can update the information inside of my DOM. So if I change my data set, uh, I will not, so the element already exists but changes its value, I will skip the enter phase and I will only go to the update phase. And in the update phase I will do something, and now we will see. 
If the element is removed from the data set, I will go in the exit phase. And in the exit phase, I can, for example, remove the element from the DOM. So this way, I can create a very linear uh, interaction between data and, 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 the, and the DOM. And I can easily map uh, values from my data points to, to, to the DOM. So in, in this small example, what I'm doing is basically, again, circles. I like circles. Circles are nice because they are defined just as three coordinates, the center and the, and the values. That's why I'm using those. If you are an infographic expert, you know that it's wrong to use the circles because circles are really hard to read. Circles use the area to define a value, and the human perception is not very good at comparing areas. So you, if you want to use this, don't use circles. Use bar charts, use lines, don't use circles. Unless you want to prevent an easy circle value. So in this case, the example shows that I have a random function which creates an object that has the x, y, and radius properties, a stroke width, and a color. All of those properties are basically random, and I will not go into details of that. And then we have a timer that is triggered every 100 milliseconds. What happens when the timer is triggered? It happens that 25% of the times an element from the data set will be removed. 75% of the times, unless uh, I am over the maximum values of uh, maximum amount of uh, circles, 75% of the times a new element will be added to the data set. Otherwise, the existing, one of the existing elements will be changed. And the other goal of all this effort is something that doesn't work. No, it does. It's here. So, uh, nice board that moves and do stuff. Why do they move? We, have to move? we haven't defined anything to move those yet. But DHX has a nice support for, sorry, for transitions. So instead of just applying in the update the new styles of new position, I'm saying, I'm saying that I should not click on that object, OK? I'm saying here, oh! <laughs> I'm saying, I will move the mouse here, so I will not click on it, uh, that I want to apply a transition. So the elements are actually changed over time instead of at, uh, in, in just one step. And transition take parameters like delay, that you can find here, or you can uh, use different equations for the transition for an uh, easing effect. But as you can see, we are all animating only the center and the radius, but in the animation, also the color is animated. Sometimes you see, sometimes you don't, but you can see that some of the moving things are changing colors. So that animation comes actually from CSS. That's why I like it, because it's transparent and it's easy. And that transition is done just by that code. So it's very easy to add a transition to using CSS. Extremely easy. For this presentation, I prepared another visualization that actually uses more meaningful data, not just random points. Again, using circles because they are easy. The visualization is this. I have a JSON. Can I close this? No. License. License. So, uh, well, I'm using Sublime Text a lot. It's a very nice editor. I really hope to switch to Mono Develop soon because the completion in the sublime text is not as good as, as good as I'd like, but the editor, per se, is kind of dangerous. <coughs> if I only can put it on the screen. Almost there. 
So here I'm loading a JSON object which contains information about plastic surgery. I'm loading it and I'm using it. This is scientific about the plate. <laughs> so I've built just three classes, three classes. One is for the a controller that controls the start here and the end here I want to compare in my visualization, in my programming. Then I have the sharp class that defines using not a very dry syntax, but I want to be, keep it exploded so it was really easy to read. So it defines the, the visualization itself. And I'm using some CSS styles to actually style it. And the result is this nice visualization that doesn't fit the screen. <laughs> and you can click on the control <laughs> and see that between the year 2001 and 2004, augmentations has uh, uh, arrived about 20%, reductions decreased by 14%, and lifts are uh, up by 37%. <laughs> so you can play around with that. You can compare visually, again, so you that not good to compare, but in this case, they were essential. <laughs> and you can play around with it as much as you like. So, what are the main differences between D3 and DHX? Of course, the first uh, big difference is the syntax. So, in uh, D3, you use a very JavaScript like approach. In X, you, we want to be more precise. Uh, so when you want to set an attribute, you use the jQuery style of using multiple arguments. So you use the same function attributes to, as a setter, as a getter, and as a setter for different types. In the DHX implementation is that you first capture the attribute you want to uh, manipulate, and then you use one of the specific functions that are associated with it. So for an attribute, you can use float, string, or if you, are, if you have already performed a data binding, you can associate that to a float function, for example. And the getter is symmetrical, so instead of just returning the value of this, you use get float or get string or what, or get what you need. So all this work went into the production of the recording, which is a visualization uh, engine. And this visualization engine has some pretty unique stuff. Again, bigger solution, not good. Next time we need to agree on what is the standard resolution for this. So this is a Sankey. In a, our approach, we decided that we wanted all of our visualization to be very easy to implement. All the API is JavaScript, is not X, there is not a public X uh, library. So it's all written in X, but is exposed as a JavaScript API. And all the code that is required to build that Sankey is just that. And actually this option could also be removed and it will still work. Of course there is more data, there is more uh, code then, but this is only the data that is used to build the visualization. Visualization are interactive, so you can associate events to the nodes. And this association is not associated to the visual entities, but to the data. So if I click on one of these nodes, I get back the data point that is generated by that, uh, that node, not the coordinates of the, the mouse, which are not interesting most of the time. We have, you can customize a lot of stuff, like in this case is another Sankey with uh, thumbnail images and uh, a different style for edges that comes back, that goes back. Same visualization, but with the edges not reduced and no thumbnails. Then we have geocharts. This was supposed to go floating that, that direction is not floating anyway, but so I need to scroll up and down. Again, geographic visualization are extremely easy to code. 
So to build this, you just add those information. We have some predefined um, template, templates, like the USA states or world countries, stuff like that. And all of these definitions are actually shortcuts.